last thing that we had yesterday was that, uh, that uh, Aaron passes away and his son Elazar takes over. And uh, chapter 21, we've got something, something it seems to be unrelated. In a minute we'll see that it really is related. But, but it, it seems to be like a, you know, a little bit of a non sequitur. That the Kananim, uh, they hear that the Jews are on their way. So, they go out to war. They, the Jewish people then make a, you know, they make a, a plea, they make a, a prayer to God. If you give these people over into our hands, then we will dedicate everything to you. Good, so they win the war. There are a few things over here that don't make a lot of sense. First of all, if you take a look in the, in the English... So, Rabbi, scroll on the side. He said, if you see, the two, it says Amalek attacks. That, uh, we don't have any Amalek. It says that they're Canaanim. It doesn't say that they're Amalekim. The problem is, though, that geographically it's not correct because what does it say? It's saying, Who sits in the Negev? Amalek sits in the Negev, not Canaan. Canaan sit in the heart of the land of Israel. So the, the Chazal, the sages teach that what was going on over here, the Amalekim understood that if they wanted to have some kind of a chance of winning the war against the Jews, they were going to have to try to disguise who they were. Why is that? Because the Jews, what are they going to do? They're going to dab them to God. The more exact the prayer is, the better the davening is going to be. So what does that mean? It means that if they pray to God that God defeat the Canaanim, but it's really not Canaanim at all, it's Amalekim, then they've got a chance because the prayer is going to go off in the wrong direction. So what do they do? They get themselves dressed up like Amalekim, I'm sorry, like Canaanim, and they go to war. They go to war against the Jewish people. However, what's the problem? It says like this. The Jewish people hear the Amalekim talking Amaleki between themselves and now they're confused because on the one hand they're wearing Canaanite clothing and on the other hand they're speaking Amaleki to each other. So look, in, in uh, verse number 2, look at this very, very generic verse, right? What did they do? How did they pray to God? They said like this, Im naton if you give this nation into our hands. <laughs> the Jews are smarter than that, right? They're not sure who it is they're fighting against because on the one hand they're wearing Canaanite clothing, on the other hand they're, um, they're speaking Amaleki. So what do they do? They daven to God that he should just make some kind of a, a like a, it's a general prayer that whoever they're fighting against they should succeed at overcoming them. Very smart. I have a little question. If the, Amalek, if the Amalekis are smart enough to understand that they could change their clothing and they can fight against the Jewish people and the Jewish people won't then know who they are, are they not smart enough to realize that maybe they shouldn't run around shouting an Amaleki to each other? You hear the problem? Right? I mean, you know, let's say, for example, you know, you've got a, a group that want to fight against another group and they want to get themselves dressed up as if they're somebody else. So it's pretty obvious, isn't it? That you put yourself, put, you know, speak the language of whoever it is that you're dressed up as. And yet what happens over here? They get dressed up like Canaanim, like Canaanites, but they carry on speaking Amaleki. So what's Pshat? How do we understand it? So I once saw an interesting, interesting, very interesting uh, interpretation over here. You know, you are what you speak. Which means one of the most fundamental dimensions of nationhood is defined by what language you speak. That's why, that's one of the reasons why every single nation has their own language. 
here, even amongst people that speak ostensibly the same language, English and Americans, right? Nevertheless, there are enough differences within English and within American English to differentiate so that each person knows. You, you, know, you know, you can listen to somebody speak, and even if they put on an English accent, but you'll know that that's not, that's, not, not, that's not native English that they're speaking over there. It will have Americanisms in it, and the other way around as well, because each, each language is being defined, it's defining the nationhood. And that means that every language has to be different because every language has to, to, to be able to, to, to project that nation who they are. Here, America and Canada, they're pretty close to each other, right? Geographically, they're very close to each other. But even the languages that they speak identify where they come from. Which is, Americans know when a Canadian is speaking, and a Canadian knows when an American is speaking, because they've got their own little, their own little personal, what, what do you want to call them? I don't know, their own little personal... Uh, vernacular accent. Vernacular, that, that it gives it away, right? So here, what's the problem? The problem is like this, that if the Amalekis get themselves dressed up as Canaanites and speak the Canaanite language, well, in a certain way, what does that mean? It means that they've become Canaanites. They're no longer Amalekis. When they speak Amalekis to each other, what are they doing? They're holding on to their identity. That's who they are in a, in, in a dimension of who they are. You can get dressed up in whatever you want. You can give over a, a facade to the outside world according to what, what you wear, right? So, for example, you know, if you, you want to go to the beach, you'll get dressed one way, right? You want to go to a job interview, you'll get dressed another way, right? Why is that? Because to each place you want to project a different kind of a persona because you go to a job interview, you're not going to go there in flip-flops and, and uh, you know, and a, and a Bermuda, you know, Bermudas, right? I mean, unless maybe the jobs in California maybe, but uh, you know, under normal circumstances you get yourself dressed up a little bit smarter than you usually would because you want to make a better impression. Is that, it, does, it, does it make any difference to the inner you? No. The inner you remains the same, right? You go to the beach, you go to the job interview, it doesn't make any difference. But we put on clothing in order to give over the, the external, what we, want, what we want you to think from the outside, what you should think about me. That's going to be reflected by the clothing that I wear. But the speech that I speak, that's the inner dimension of who I really am. And to give that up, what am I doing? If I give up my mode of speech, if I give up my, my method of being able to communicate, then what have I just done? I've given up my identity. It's interesting, you should know, right, that, that very often when people move from one country to another, one of the things that they always do is that they try, they try to take courses to speak the language of where they're going to in the way that they speak the language over there. Get the accents right, you know, get, get, use, get the vocabulary, learn how to speak, because then they imagine that they'll be, able to, they'll be able to blend in a lot better and people won't realize that they come from a different country. Of course it never works. Because, you know, every language has got its own nuances and when you've been brought up with it, you, you, just, you just know them. And somebody can learn. Here, I don't know if you ever, if you, you hear diplomats speaking, they speak in English. Some of these diplomats speak fantastic English. R really, fantastic English. But you know, as a native English speaker, you know that that's not, that's not his mother tongue. You know that. What's called in Yiddish is mamaloshin. You just know it. So that's why. What are they doing over here? They can't speak. If they start speaking Canaanite to each other, then they're no longer Amalekis. They've lost their identity, which is why they're prepared to get dressed up. They're prepared to go and put on the Canaanite clothing in order to confuse the Jewish people, but they're not going to start speaking the Canaanite language because that would change the essence of who they are. Now, why is their essence so important? Because they're going to war against the Jews, right? And this is Amalek. And Amalek, of course, the, the very essence of Amalek is to battle the Jewish people. Where does Amalek come from? Amalek comes from the, the source of disagreement, the source of argument. When there are arguments within the Jewish world, then Amalek will raise its head and become very strong. Over here, 
Remember I told you at the beginning, it looks like there's a, like a non sequitur. It looks like it's going from the death of Aaron into something brand new. And here we're, we're moving on now, but it's not true. Because in the oral tradition it says that when Aaron died, what happened? The clouds of glory disappeared. Why did the clouds of glory disappear? Because they were there because of Aaron's merit. Aaron brought the clouds of glory. If you remember, Miriam brought the water, Aaron brought the clouds of glory, and Moshe brings the manna, the food that they eat. The clouds of glory are no longer there. They've got no protection anymore. Normally the protection disappears from the Jewish people. Why? Because they're arguing with each other. Amalek see the clouds of glory have gone, and what do they imagine? that now they've got an opportunity. Now they've got, they've got this, this opportunity to fight against the Jewish people because obviously something's not right over there. So, I tell you, I, I, don't, I don't like saying these things very often. I really don't. But if anybody has any, you know, you look around the world today, it's absolutely astonishing how the non-Jewish world regards Israel the state of Israel, and the Jews. It's absolutely astonishing, really. I heard, I heard an, an interview, you know, the, the three mothers of these three boys that have been kidnapped, they went to Geneva, to the United Nations, to speak over there. And uh, they interviewed one of, the, one of the women that accompanied them. And the interviewer asked her a very simple question. You know, they went to Geneva, to the United Nations, the place was full of diplomats, it was full of, it was full of ambassadors. And they spoke, they spoke about the fact that their children have done nothing and they want their children to be brought back. And they... So afterwards the interviewer asked the, the, this lady who accompanied them, a lawyer, he asked her, did anybody come up to these mothers and say anything to them? You know, did anybody come and offer support, moral support? You know, tell them that they're thinking about them. Tell them that, you know, just, just to, to, to come and give them a proverbial shake of their hand and say, you know, we're with you. And she said, no, not one person. D does anybody understand this? C can anybody explain this? I, I mean, it's, it's absolutely inexplicable, isn't it? Three teenagers go missing. They've been kidnapped. And the whole world just, they don't care. They just don't care. You know why? Because they're Jewish. And the anti-Semitism, which has now been transferred to anti-Israel, which is nothing more than just anti-Semitism dressed up in a, in a different, you know, in a slightly different package. You want to know where this is all coming from? It's coming from the fact that we don't get on with each other. That's where it's coming from. If the Jewish nation were more unified, if the Jewish nation were more in tune with each other and with each other's needs, I'm not talking about everybody becoming orthodox. That would be nice too, it really would. I'm just talking about the ability for Jews to live together in harmony. The greater the unity, the greater is the ability for everybody to live together. The greater that ability is for everyone to live together, the less the less danger there is for the Jewish people. You listen to the politicians speak. I mean, you could really, you, could, you, can, you, can, uh, you, can, you can become nauseous from all of this. Yeah, I, I think, I, I didn't hear the um, comments of the women, the mothers of, of the kidnapped children before the UN, but I did hear people referring to it and I think some of the people in attendance who did not go up and shake hands or acknowledge support or anything like that may have felt politically that it was set in bias of what they might oppose in an idealistic way. So rather than appear to be sympathetic They'd rather not say anything. Yeah, you know, and Patrick. Just, oof, you know, just. You should be. You should be ashamed of yourself for, <laughs> for even for even coming up with that. No, it's totally right? true, though. It, of course, I mean, it's totally true. It's that's what we all that's... wanted to say, but like, who wants to say that? Because it's so ugly. It's like my political bent is more important. My persona is more important yeah, than caring. Isn't, isn't that? Care. Isn't that? I mean, where on earth is anybody's moral 
direction. What's going on over here? It doesn't make any sense. And you know, all, all they said was that they just stood up over there. All they said was, bring us our boys back. We want to be able to embrace them again. And we want to be able to have them back in our homes again. I mean, you know, they, they didn't talk about anything that had any, any, kind, any kind of political dimension to it, any kind of an ideological dimension to it. It was just mothers wanting their sons back. That's all. You know, I, something else I heard right after that was, what is it, Hani, 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 the political leader for Hamas. Honey, honey, eh? Oh, yeah. He, I can't remember the name. How do you pronounce it? But he, the political leader of Hamas, not yeah. PA or not any, and, and not the political leader of Pug, but Hamas. And um, he, he accused uh, Israel of concealing the true identity of the uh, Israeli American. Uh, Frankel, and he said he's really an IDF soldier. And so they posted a photograph of who he claimed was Frankel in, in, in a uniform. And then the picture that of him, at, you know, with the other two boys, you know, that everyone uses to yeah. identify them. They didn't even look remotely alike. And <laughs> he said... Here's proof. He's a soldier. He's an Israeli soldier. Listen, the, world, the world is going to believe whatever the world wants to believe. If we want to change the world's, the world's approach, we have to change the approach to ourselves. We have to be more open to each other. We have to be more flexible to each other. We have to be more accommodating to each other. If we do that, then we, then we can turn around everything that's going on right now. But if we, if we don't do that, then things, things will presumably just go from bad to worse. You've been around and dealing with this a lot longer than I have. I've only been thinking about it for maybe months. But, like, this, this whole state of Israel is the size of the county I'm from. <laughs> and literally, if you took that county and splashed it right in the middle of the United States, it'd be a pinprick. And all of the Arab nations and the Muslim nations sure. around us, like... It's, it's like the, the, the edge of a tsunami. Like, we just sit here, and they all want to crush us, but whatever, God's will is the only thing holding them back, because they would do it. Yeah. I don't know why they don't just do it, but they don't do it. Like, how do you live every day without, like, wanting to be a million more than them and stop them? Like, it, it gets to a point where you just you feel so motivated to do something, but we're so small, we're so few. There's 15 million in a world of 7 billion. Like, yeah. It's just drives you crazy. Which means... We, we have to, I mean, for sure, we have to try to build up our physical numbers. It's important. It's very important. I mean, I've mentioned that a few times, you know, that, uh, that uh, at the end of the Second World War, what was that, 70 years ago, there were 12 million Jews left in the world. There aren't very many more now. 70 years later, there aren't very many more. By now, there should be, you know, 20, 20 plus million Jews in the world, right? Because, you know, just take it and extrapolate it. That's the way that it's supposed to go. We seem to be doing a fine job in destroying ourselves. We really do, actually. I mean, isn't that good news? That our population stays low? Because every time it reaches a certain point, don't we experience some grand tragedy? I don't know. There are two ways of looking at it, right? Which is that... Uh, if, if, if the population grows without a, without a commensurate growth in spiritual connection, then, yeah, you know what, maybe it's, not, uh, maybe it's not so great. But if the population growth comes together with that spiritual connection, then that's, that's exactly the way that it's supposed to be. That, the, the, uh, you know, that spirituality will bring into the world, the whole world will be different, completely different, if only, if only we would do what we were supposed to do. I think, isn't that like saying, you know, what do you do with the assimilated in light of the more observant expanding? Even the number staying the same, maybe, overall. But if there's growth on the observant yeah. end, yeah. Does, that, it, does that mean that there's progress being oh, made for sure. among the assimilated? 
Among the assimilated, I don't know. Yeah, that, there's, a, there's a growth. That, there's, there's a growth in the in the Orthodox world. There's a growth. The growth is coming from two places. It's coming from the Bali Tshuva, which are the people who are coming back to some kind of some kind of a Jewish connection, and it's coming also from the high birth rate of the Jewish community, the Orthodox Jewish community. Which means that right now we're holding our own. The numbers are remaining reasonably steady, and in a few years' time they'll start to grow. Uh, which on the one hand is fantastic, but on the other hand it's not so good because it means that the non-affiliated Jews are, are they're, they're, they're being lost in droves. And even though on the one hand it's fantastic that the Orthodox communities are growing by leaps and bounds and, and uh, you know, they're, they're establishing communities all over the place and that truly is something absolutely wondrous, but on the other hand, now what we, what we really do have to, to put a lot of emphasis now on just trying to keep the non-Orthodox Jewish community within the Jewish camp. Just keep everybody, that's what we've got to do, keep everybody in, right? We, we, need to, we need to daven that, that, you know, that, that every Jew gets married to a Jew. That's what we need to daven. We need to daven that even if, even if they don't keep anything, right? But let, let's keep that, you know, we need everybody. And... We've got to try to do something to stop, you know, in a certain way that the, the non-affiliated Jewish communities, they're hemorrhaging. It's something terrible, it really is. And that's something that we have to, we have to work on somehow. We have to be able to try to, to make some kind of an impact and to go out and show people that it's good to be Jewish and they don't have anything to be embarrassed about and they don't have anything that they, you know, that they, they it, it's, it's unbelievable the shame that some people feel because of the fact that they're Jewish. There's nothing to be shameful about. A person should be proud. You should be proud that you're Jewish. You know, again, I'm not talking about keeping anything. Just be proud to be Jewish. Be proud enough to be Jewish that you want to get married to another Jew. Let's start with that, right? It's Hashem. You know, as, as, as time will progress, it's Hashem. Those people will be exposed to Orthodox Jews and Orthodoxy, and maybe maybe they'll be they'll they'll start to take on little bits and pieces. But let's let's work on on just retaining Jewish identity. That's what we need to do. Good. Whatever. Okay, that's a a little a little message, right? Here, let's go on. So they gotta go around the land of Edom because they're not allowed to go in, right? And they become very upset, right? Because you, you can imagine right now they're at the end of their journey. They've been 40 years in the desert. They were sure that they're going to go through the land of Edom and go straight into the land of Israel. That's it. They're done, right? And now all of a sudden, what are they here? No, no, no. I'm sorry. You can't go in. You've you got to go, you go around. So they become upset. And they come in front of God and they come in front of Moshe and they say, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in the desert? And, and you know, we're going to die over here. We've got no bread. We have no water. Listen to the, listen to the self-contradiction of what they're saying. Right? What do they say? Listen again. Ki ein lechem the ein mayim, which means what? There's no bread and there's no water. Yeah? The nafshenu kotza belechem akloikel, and our souls are disgusted with the insubstantial food. Oh, didn't you just say there was no food? <laughs> you just said there's no bread. And now you're coming and saying that you're, you're disgusted with the lechem akloikel, the insubstantial bread. But you just said there was no bread. Now you're saying there is bread, but it's not good enough. What's going on? So the answer is, what, what are they referring to? When they talk about the lechem akloikel, what are they talking about? What is this insubstantial bread? What is it? That's the manna, right? This, this food that's been brought to them every single day in the desert. Oh, so now we understand. Let's go read it again. Ein lechem ve'ein mayim. There's no physical bread and there's no physical water. And this spiritual stuff that you're giving us over here just doesn't do the job. You hear what the difference is between? It's not a contradiction over here. It's not saying there's no bread and there's no water and the bread is no good. It's saying there's no bread, there's no water, the regular stuff. When, 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 whenever you, you know, if I mention the word bread, whatever you conjure up in your mind, they don't have any of that. And what, when no water, there's nothing to drink. 
So what are they going to do? They're going to eat the manna, but they don't want to eat the manna anymore. Why not? Because the manna does not satisfy them. Why would that be? So the no first, effort. huh? There's no effort. You didn't earn it. There's no effort. They didn't earn it, right? What's known as what's known as as hated bread, nama de chasufa. But there's something absolutely fascinating over here as well. The, the bread, the, the, the manna will only satisfy you according to your spiritual level. Which means if you're a real spiritual guy, then the manna is going to fill you up and you're going to feel great, right? But if you're not such a spiritual guy, what's going to happen? It just, it's not going to do it. It just isn't, right? And they're at the end of their tether already. They're, they're waiting to go into the land of Israel. They're becoming more physical. They want to go in. They want to work the land. They want to, they want to harvest and plant and grow and reap. And the manna is becoming less and less something which can sustain them. You know, Chazal, the sages say the most incredible thing. The manna, the manna had this kind of ethereal dimension to it. You know, when it, when it was delivered on your doorstep, it may have tasted like whatever you wanted it to taste like, but it didn't look like that. It had some kind of a, I don't know, it's difficult. It was like opaque. It was, it was some kind of a, who knows, I don't even know what it looked like exactly. And there it was. And you could, you could wish that this thing tastes like chocolate cake, right? With, with chocolate icing and, and a cherry on the top. But if it doesn't look like that, then you're, 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 you know, you're lacking an enormous dimension of where your pleasure comes from and the satiation that you feel comes from the way that food looks. They're just, they're just not satisfied with what they're given. You know, <laughs> I remember when microwaves first came out, so for a long time they weren't very popular. You know why? Because microwaves cook from the inside out. Regular, regular food, you put it in the oven, it cooks from the outside in. Right, the microwaves, because of the waves, it cooks the food from the inside and then it works its way out. And microwaves don't brown food. Which means that you can have a, you can have a delicious plate of, you know, whatever it is, I don't know, macaroni cheese, right? If that's what gets you going. But, because it's got, it hasn't been grilled, which means that the cheese on the top doesn't have that, sort of like that, that, delicious brownie looking look to it so people didn't want to eat the stuff even though the stuff was complete it was completely cooked but it came out it looked unappetizing so i don't know if they still do this but there, there was a, for a while they were bringing out they were bringing out microwave making microwaves with a grill built in so after the thing had been cooked it would then grill itself for, for whatever it was you know three minutes or something just to give it the appearance of the way that it would look when it came out of the oven because they realize that people, you know, the, the way that something looks, it's very, it's very, very important. It really is. So the Jewish people come and they complain. We, we want real food. We don't, we don't want this, this mystical, you know, uh, this, this spiritual, opaque, whatever it is. We want the real thing. Is that, Rabbi Lefer, is that saying, did, did they lose their desire? Is, is that what it, is, is it? No, quite the opposite. They, 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 They've lost, you know what, they've, they've, they're losing their spiritual connection in a certain way, which means that the, minute, the, the, the less their spiritual connection is, the less they're able to relate to the manna. That's it, they don't want it, they, they want physical food now. And all of a sudden now there's an outbreak of, of serpents and snakes and they're, they're busy biting and they're killing. It's something terrible. Many people died because of this. And they come and they say to Moshe, you know what, we've sinned. We, we spoke badly about you. We spoke badly about God. That, you know, snakes from the time of the Garden of Eden, snakes are a symbol of Lashon Hara, speaking badly. They spoke badly, so HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent snakes in order to punish them. Anybody here, the medical corps, anybody here, 
doctors? Anybody here a doctor? Oh, yeah, the, uh, the icon. The, the icon, right? What is the logo of the medical corps? Oh, the snake, yeah. It's a stick with a snake, right, wrapped around it on the top. Where does it come from? Over here. Let's read it through. Let's have a look. Make for yourself a serpent and put it up on a stick. Anybody who looks up and sees this snake as it's being passed around the around the uh, the camp, right? They are going to be. They're going to survive. Again, it's it's not the snake which is causing them to survive. What is it? It's causing them to look up to God, to remember that God's there in the Shemaim, in the heavens, and that God will take care of them if you do what you're supposed to do. So he made a copper snake, and he put it up on the stick. And anybody who looked at this copper snake, he would survive if he'd been bitten. Right? Now, if anyone's paying attention, Akodesh Baruch Hu says that he should make a saraf, which is a serpent. Again, I don't know exactly what the difference is between a serpent and a snake in English. Somebody once wanted to say that a serpent lives in, in, the, in the water and snakes live on the land. Maybe. I don't know. Here, here in, in, uh, in Lashon HaKodesh, in Hebrew, saraf and achash are two different things. A saraf is something which, again, serpent, it's a different, it's a different kind of a snake. God tells Moshe to make a saraf and put it up on a stick. What does Moshe make? He makes a nachash, which is something else. He makes a snake instead of a serpent. Right? Why would that be? So it's interesting that the, ser that the sages are called seraphim. They're called, that they're given this title. You've got to be careful of the sages. You shouldn't, you shouldn't do things you know, against them. Because you can burn yourself when it comes to when it comes to you know mistreating these people. God is telling Moshe, I'm upset with the Jewish people because they spoke badly about you. Therefore, make a saraf, which is a symbol of the Talmud Chacham, the symbol of the, of the great scholar, and put it up on the stick, and everybody will see that you know that if they look up to the if they look up to the to the to the symbol of the Talmud Chacham, they'll survive. But Moshe is upset because why? Because they spoke badly against God. The Nachash is, is putting the emphasis onto what they've, they've spoken Lashon Hara against God. So what does Moshe do? Even though God tells him to put a Saraf, Moshe comes along and puts up a Nachash because he wants them to understand. No, she doesn't care. he doesn't care about himself, Moshe. They should say whatever they want to say about him. It's not going to bother him. What bothers Moshe is that they don't do what God wants them to do. The only, thing, the only thing that motivates Moshe is God's honor. Nothing else. So he puts up the Nachash instead. And then, Baruch Hashem, the, the, uh, the, this, whatever, this punishment comes to an end. And here, verse number 10, So they come to this place called Avot. Where is that? We're getting very close now to Moab, which means we're coming very close. We're coming into, into the border area between Jordan and Israel right now. And they're coming over here to this place, and they get to this place called Nachal Zored. Okay, it's a little bit of a little, little bit of geographic uh, description over here about where they are. The Eshed and Achalim Asher Natal Sheves or Venishan Ligvon Moyav. Umishan Beirahu, a bear a show Omar Hashem the Moshe, a soif as a am, Vietnam Lehem Mayim. And they went to the well. Again, we, it's interesting, we're coming back. Even we started off with the death of Miriam and the lack of the water, and now we're coming back to this well. Right? So let's have a look and see. There's some very, very poetic language over here, which is very difficult to do justice to. Any kind of poetry, when you translate, right, it's going to lose the, the nuances on the way. It's going to lose the beauty 
of, of, the, of the poetry in the original language. But it says like this, Oz Yashi Yisrael. Right? This is considered to be one of the ten songs, one of the nine songs that have been sung so far. The tenth one will be sung by the Messiah when he comes. He should come very soon in Mitzvah Hashem. Oz Yashi Yisrael es Hashira Hazoi. They sang this song. Alei ve'er enu lo. Come up, oh well. Announce, announce yourself. Ve'er chafaru asarim karua nedivei ha'am v'mechokeik v'mishan o'isam. The well that the princes dug and the nobles of the people excavated through a lawgiver with their staff, a gift from the wilderness. What's he talking about? Of course, he's talking about Moshe Rabbeinu bringing water out of this well by using his stick. And now the, the, uh, the uh, scene has been set for the Jewish people coming right now to the border of the land of Israel. And they're going to come across somebody else over here who they're going to go to battle against. Who is that? Somebody called Sichon. Sichon? Sichon is the, uh, we're going to see the king of Sichon okay, is, a, uh, is an extremely powerful giant. And there's going to be a very, a very pro prolific confrontation is going to take place over here. So they send emissaries to the king. Sound familiar? Exactly the same language that was used when Moshe asked to go through the land of Edom. It's exactly the same language that's being used over here. But what's interesting? Who's saying it? Huh? The Jewish people send. Which means that whatever they needed, whatever lesson they had to learn by Edom, they learned. They realized that Moshe is right, and the only way to do this is what? We're, we're gonna, we're, what are they offering over here? We're not going to go right or left. We're not going to eat from your food. We're not going to drink from your drink. We just need passage to get through your country. We're not going to drain your resources. We just want to go from here to there. It goes out to war. There's no dialogue over here. There's no Sichon coming along and saying, guys, please don't do this. I don't want to fight against you. They just come out with their army. And the, uh, they, they win. It, it is verbatim. Yeah. They finally learned a lesson, right? They're overtaking land, right? They're conquering land now, which was conquered by Sichon from a different nation. Okay. The Sichon, the, the nation of Sichon has been destroyed. So now they're sitting in, in the land of Emor. What do they call it over here? Em Amorites. Amorites, whatever. The land of the Amorites. All this stuff in, in you know, bi biblical English is uh, pretty weird stuff, right? The Amorites. And uh, what happens next? Here, verse number 32. And he sends out, he sends out spies. And they overtake that place as well. And they now, Oig, Melech Haboshan, Oig, the king of Bashan, Oig is somebody that for some reason Moshe is scared of. Why is he scared? So, like I started to tell you when I got a little bit muddled up over there. Og goes back a long way. Og goes back, first goes back to Noah, but the first time that we come across him 
as, you know, as a person inside of the Torah is by Avram Avinu. He comes to Avram Avinu and tells him that Lot has been captured. Avram's nephew Lot has been captured. And Avram goes off to try to get him back. Say the sages, why did Og do what he did? Not for altruistic reasons at all. He wanted to get married to Sarah. So he was sure that Avram Avinu would go to fight against his kings. Avram would be killed over there. And then he would be able to take Sarah and get married to her instead. Say the sage is the most incredible thing. Avra, Mo, Moshe Rabbeinu is scared of Og. Why is he scared of him? Because he's got this merit. A long time ago, he did a good thing. He didn't even do it for the right reason. Right? <laughs> he did it for all the wrong reasons. And yet, Moshe Rabbeinu is scared of him. It's the most incredible idea. Rabbi, I don't know if you're listening, but when you do a mitzvah, the, 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 the weight of that mitzvah carries with it, it's unbelievable. Here you've got Og, who did a mitzvah, as it were, right? By telling Avram Avinu that Lot had been captured, he did it for the wrong reason, there was nothing good about what he did at all, and yet, Avram was able to then go and recapture Lot and to release him, and it's looked upon as being a mitzvah, imagine. So imagine what kind of reward you're going to get for mitzvahs that you'll do when you mean to do them for the right reasons. That's pretty neat, no? So it says like this. There's the most incredible, the most incredible confrontation over here between Moshe Rabbeinu and Og Melech Haboshim. It says that Moshe Rabbeinu was ten amot tall. That's pretty tall. It's like three stories. He's ten amot tall, and he had a stick that was ten amot high. And he jumped into the air, ten amot, and he hit Og on either his heel or his ankle, and Og then collapses. So says the Mashal, one of the classic commentaries on the Gemara talk, talks <laughs> about these sort of these more esoteric dimensions. He says that this is not it's not a physical confrontation, this is a spiritual confrontation. Og represents everything which is wrong in the world, everything which is negative in the world, everything which is not spiritual in the world. It's enor Og is enormous, he's absolutely enormous, because here in the physical world that we live in, we imagine that the physicality is more important. The physicality, the materialism of the world, is, it, it takes precedence over here, right? And Moshe goes to battle against Og. And the three ten, says the Mashal, they represent three different things. They represent the Ten Commandments and they represent the Ten Statements that God brought the world into being with and they represent the ten, the, ten, uh, the ten plagues that God brought the Jewish people out of Egypt with. Which means that what Moshe is battling against Og, he's battling from a spiritual perspective. There's nothing physical about this battle right now. The, the beauty of what we're learning over here is like this, that the physical world is enormous, the physical world is very powerful, the physical world has a habit of seducing us into imagining that this is what there is and there is nothing else. The spiritual realms are, in our perception, much, much smaller. Og represents the bad, Moshe represents the good, and Moshe is not very tall in ratio to Og. And yet, where does he hit him? He hits him on the heel. The heel represents everything which, you know, like, like the sages say, that the heel is a part of your body that, that it treads on the ground, it treads on the dust. Anything that's not important to the secular world, that's what's important to us, to the non-spiritual dimensions. Whatever they look at as being not important, that's what's important for us. And that's where Moshe Rabbeinu, that's where he destroys Og. Through what? Through his heel. It's interesting. In Greek mythology, right? You have the uh, Achilles, you have, you have your, in your body, you have your Achilles tendon. If you know the story in, in Greek mythology of what happened to <coughs> poor old Achilles, right? Who was dipped into the water and his mother <coughs> held onto him by his heel. So his heel was the only part of the water that he was dipped into that didn't, there wasn't, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't in contact with the water which means that that was the only part of his body that wasn't invincible. And in the end, how did he die? An archer shot an arrow and it pierced his, uh, it pierced his heel and that was, the, that, was a, that was a vulnerable part of his body. 
the vulnerable part of the of the body that Moshe Rabbeinu is fighting against, which is that the, the physicality, the materialism, is that same idea. The, the bit at the bottom of the body, the bit that's the furthest away, the bit that touches the ground, the bit, the bit that we don't pay very much attention to. What we're learning over here is something very, very beautiful. That ultimately the spiritual powers will overcome the physical powers. It doesn't matter how big the, physical, how, how big the physicality looks. Ultimately, the spirituality, the spirituality is going to win. So our job over here is to become more in tune with that, right? To become more familiar with the spiritual dimensions so that we can help bring more light into the world. The more light there is, the clearer everything is going to be. Right? Right. Okay, we're going to stop over here. Mitzvah Hashem.